So I'm going to speak now about uh, generative models and I'm going to focus um, in particular on uh, GANs or generative adversarial networks. Um, so there are another, other types of generative models out there. Um, and one particularly popular one is um, variational autoencoders, but I don't have time to cover everything, so I'm just going to focus on GANs in this talk. Um, so just to sort of uh, give a bit of uh, background, so what a generative model is, is um, a model sort of either explicit or implicit of, of a probability distribution that you can draw samples from, right? So it's a model of P of X given some parameters usually that we can somehow sample from. And a classic example of this is a, a Gaussian mixture model, which I've shown on the right here. So the, the graph on the top is a mixture of Gaussians, and it can be sort of represented by you know, this mixture model at the bottom here, where we've got three different Gaussians with different means. So the means are represented by the red lines um, and different standard deviations. And you know, the probability of any observation is just some um, convex combination of these Gaussians, right? So by convex combination, I mean that you know, the, way, the, the coefficients here um, are all between 0 and 1, and they add up to 1, right? So you have some basically linear combination of Gaussians. Um, and why is this a generative model? Well, it's because it's easy to generate samples from this model, right? So if you want to sample from a mixture of Gaussians, you just first of all sample from the categorical distribution, which has these things as parameters. So if there's three of these, there's going to be you know, three parameters of your categorical distribution, each parameter saying how likely a sample is to come from that category. So you sample from that, that's an easy thing to do. Once you have the sample from that, that picks the, the Gaussian that you're in, right? and then you just sample from the corresponding Gaussian, right? And that will give you samples from the distribution up the top, right? So it's a generative model in the sense that we can easily generate as many samples as we want from it. Um, so if you don't know, you know, Gaussian mixture models are used for all sorts of things. You know, they're used in anomaly detection and in various other applications. And um, you can fit them quite easily using a, a powerful algorithm called expectation maximization. Um, and drawing samples is just as I said. But the problem with these simple mixture models is that they're generally kind of not complicated enough to model the kind of things that we care about in, in image and video and, and audio analysis and things like that. Because images and videos and audio samples and text and things like that generally aren't easy to model with mixtures of Gaussians unless you've got a huge number of these Gaussians. And the more of them you have, the more parameters you have to fit, and it becomes infeasible to, to do that. Um, OK, just to say something about why, why, why this stuff is, why, why, would you, why do we care? I mean, why, do, why is this important? Um, so, I mean, they, they, uh, these generative models allow you to do several things. Uh, first of all, they model either implicitly or explicitly the probability density of, of the image space. So they give you some model of where the images are. And most of your image space is going to be empty because if you draw a random image, it's just going to be noise, right? So it's nice to have some, some model of of you know, what, the, what the distribution of images looks like. Um, and understanding the probability, or something about the probability of, of samples from the space, uh, so the P of, P of X here, like, can often help you to, to model something you care about, like P of Y given X, and Y in this case could be the class of an image, or what objects it contains, or a caption, or, or whatever, right? something conditioned on the image. Uh, one of the most interesting things about doing this is to generate novel content, which I'm going to show a few examples of in a while. So using generative models, you can actually create new images that we've never seen before, right? So that's kind of a cool application. Um, and then, you know, some works recently have decided to take this a little bit further and say, well, can we use these things to generate training data for, um, you know, training a classifier or something like that? And that might seem at the, at the start, well, no, not really, because you'd need to know the classes and things like that. But actually, there's some tricks, and you can. So one, one thing I've seen recently people doing, which is kind of interesting, is uh, so you can imagine you know, video games are a cool way to generate training data for things, right? Because you can generate as many examples of things in various different orientations just by, you know, if you want, if you want lots of examples of cars, you just play a video game with cars and drive them around, and you see lots of examples of cars. The problem with doing this is that they're not samples from the real world, right? So what will often happen is that your, your classifier will get very good at picking up the kind of details that are put into video games that don't occur in reality, right? So it kind of learns to cheat. All right, but what you can do then is you can get a GAN to try and um, generate more realistic samples that are conditioned on, on this image but look like things in the real world, and then use that as training data, for example. So that's one of the examples of it. Uh, they have apl artistic applications. You can use them for things like image completion. And also, you know, if you can draw samples, you can do any kind of Monte Carlo estimation. right? So Monte Carlo estimation is basically when you, basically, instead of, you want, you want some statistic. Um, so to, to estimate that statistic, you draw lots of random samples, and then you estimate them on the samples. 
Um, so the idea of this is sort of comes from 2014. I'm sure most people have heard about it. And it's to pit a discriminator against a generator, right? So these are two going to be deep models. And they're going to be trying to trick each other. So I'm going to just, just show you this instead of uh, talking through it, because it's easier to show. So this is the kind of a setup that we have. Um, we have some real world images, right, which we just gather from you know, ImageNet or CIFAR 10 or Flickr or whatever you want. Um, and we'd like to generate sort of samples using our, so we'd like to take some noise, right? This is usually just Gaussian random noise or something that's easy for us to generate, right? Typically Gaussian. Pass it through some function and, and produce samples that look like real world images. Okay, so that's, that's the objective. Um, so these are both deep neural networks and uh, we generally don't know the, the, the weights of these. And what we're gonna do is basically try generate samples and then we'll have a discriminator try to tell whether they're real or fake, right? And that's, that's the sort of high level idea. I'll go into more details in a minute. So the generator can be, can be any sort of differentiable function, but usually it's a deep neural network. This is a classic example of what people use called a DC GAN or deep convolutional generative adversarial network. And basically its job is to map you know, some reasonably low dimensional simple noise like Gaussian to something that's an image, right? So in this case, it goes through several sets of deconvolutions and stuff like that to, to get to an image, right? And the idea is you want this to look realistic. And you can come up with all sorts of ways of designing this, right? Residual connections, whatever you want. Like. Um, and then the discriminator, well, it's usually just a, another deep network, right? But it's kind of going in the opposite way, going from image down to you know, something like a, a binary output saying, yes, it is um, real, or no, it's, it's fake, OK? Um, so the idea to train them is we just alternate between training the generator and the discriminator, right? So, what you first do is you fix the weights on the generator and draw samples um, from both the real world and the generated images. So basically, we lock the weights there, right? So we're not going to change the weights. So at the start, this is going to generate pretty, pretty bad samples, right? Which I've shown here, right? Because it doesn't know anything about the real world. It's really mapping noise to noise. And then you pull a batch of real world images as well, right? From up here. And then you feed them into this discriminator. And you train the discriminator for a few epochs or a few, few iterations, right? until it sort of learns a little bit about how to dis distinguish between the ones on the bottom and the ones on the top. And at the start, you can imagine this job is not going to be too difficult, right? It's reasonably easy to determine whether something is real or fake here. It's going to pick up on things like, well, real images tend to have strong edges that are longer, right? And this random noise doesn't. So let's look for things like that, right? Um, OK, so you do that. And then you then backpropagate when to, to update your discriminator, just do your, you know, stochastic gradient descent or whatever you want. Um, and then um, your discriminator's gotten a little bit better. So now you fix the weights on the discriminator, right? So this, these don't change. Um, we don't use the real world images at all anymore, right? Um, and simply, we now train the generator alone. So we, we draw random Gaussian samples, generate samples here, and now we, we go forward through the discriminator and it'll probably say, yeah, this is a fake image, right? So we have some loss here. We can backpropagate the loss through the discriminator without actually updating the weights, right? So just do backpropagation until you get the error signal coming out here. Right? And then you can update the generator, right? So you can make the generator better at fooling the discriminator. But that's the idea. So that's kind of um, the sort of general idea. Then you just alternate back and forth, back and forth, right? Bit of discriminator training, bit of generator training. Each of them getting a little bit better at each stage. That's the idea. Um, so you can see sort of in diagrams what this kind of looks like. This is the generator here, right? And what it's doing, imagine Z here is our, our easily generated noise, right? In this case, it's sort of random uniform noise. And imagine that we want to just sort of generate samples from a, a Gaussian distribution, which is this sort of dotted one here, right? And initially, our weights are pretty bad, right? So Z is just mapping all the points over to here, right? And this is what we'd like to generate, and this is what it is generating, right? And then we chain our, our, our um, discriminator, right? And it learns, OK, well, anything on, on the, this side is probably real, and anything on this side is probably fake, right? So then we, we lock this, and we train our generator. And it learns, OK, well, to fool the discriminator, I need to move over to the left a little bit, right? And then we keep on doing this over and over again. And eventually, you know, we hopefully snap onto the true distribution there, right? And this is a very simple example, just with a Gaussian. But the, the principle's the same. And then, you know, the, the, at the end of training, we would hope that our discriminator can no longer tell the difference between the two, right? So it just doesn't, 
It's just confused. It doesn't know whether things are real or fake. So it's, it's at least 0.5. Does that make sense? OK, so this is the algorithm from the paper. So I just want to point out what's going on. Uh, to save you some try time trying to, to, to parse this when you're reading it. Um, so there's two sort of parts of the training. There's the, the top part, which is the training the discriminator. The bottom part, which is training the generator. Um, in the discriminator training, we just sample batches from you know, the real world and from our generator. Right? And then this is just your sort of cross-entropy loss here right between them. Right? So you've got the, you're trying to say that you know, um, the discriminator wants to be able to like, you know, make, say, say fake when they're fake ones and say real when they're real ones. So this is just a standard loss. And then in the generator, you know, it might look a bit weird what's going on here, but basically we, we just drop this term because we haven't got anything um, from the real world anymore, right? So what you're left with is just the other term, right? And then you can get the gradient and backpropagate that through and update the generator. So that's the idea. Okay, so that sort of sounds good. And let's see what some of the generated images look like for, for just what I've said here, right? So this is a, a DC GAN, basically, right? Trained just, and this is a classic GAN way of training them, right? Uh, so these are a couple of years old, but if you take ImageNet and you just train something on that with a, a generator that's generating something like 32 by 32 sized images, right? It's kind of difficult to get these things to scale up to huge images, but uh, you know, we can do a little bit better now, but this is just a few years ago. So the images on the left are real images from ImageNet that have been resized to 32 by 32, and the images on the right are generated ones. So while you know, it's pretty clear that some of them aren't real, there, it is understanding some of the statistics of natural images, right? So, I mean, there's, there's things that are recognizable as kind of animals and sort of funny-looking creatures and lava or whatever. There's all sorts of weird things in there. But it's learned something about, you know, natural images, although not completely convincingly. One of the reasons for this is that GANs find it quite difficult when the, the domain that you're trying to, to work with is very diverse, right? So if you actually restrict your focus to just modeling faces, you'll do better, right? Or just modeling, well, we'll see some, some restricted domains examples. Uh, this is the same thing if you train it on CIFAR 10. So CIFAR 10 is, if you don't know, is a, another data set, a smaller one of, of little small images, right? And have ten, which have 10 different classes. So we've got you know, less diversity in the domain and smaller images. And it does a bit better, right? Because there's recognizable horses in here. And yeah, I mean, this is sort of some sort of vehicle and things like that. So you can kind of see what, it, what, what it's doing. Um, this is an example of DC GAN, which is trained by a guy called Alec Radford on album covers. So he got a whole load of album covers off the internet and trained a DC GAN to generate album covers. And it's pretty good, right? I mean, it generates things that from a distance look like they could be album covers that you would see. So you can see there's text and stuff, right? It doesn't say anything, but it's, it looks like text, right? So, you know, it's kind of it's good. Um, this is bedrooms as well, right? So again, restricting the domain quite significantly now to just pictures of bedrooms. Um, and you train on this for a while and you start generating bedrooms and they look pretty good. I mean, on close inspection, you'll tell that they're not bedrooms, but from a glance, you can see windows, you can see beds, you can see pillows, you know, you can see paintings on the walls and various things that you might expect to see in a bedroom. So it's kind of got the distribution of bedroom images pretty, pretty good, right? Uh, so that all sounds kind of, kind of good, right? But uh, there is some, some problems, right? So it's not so easy always to just take one of these things, code it up yourself and, and run it, and then everything works out because uh, training them is known to be quite difficult. Um, and the reason that it's quite difficult is because you're not really seeking a, um, you know, a local minimum like you, you would be in a lot of other types of optimization problems. You're really seeking a saddle point, right? You're seeking to minimize one thing, right, and sort of maximize another thing in a different direction, right? So, you know, the, the generator and the discriminator are kind of fighting against each other, right? And it's harder to get the, these saddle points. Um, so the dynamics can sometimes be unstable, which means that, you know, if you train your generator a bit too much, right, um, then, you know, the, the discriminator just doesn't know how to tell the difference anymore and nobody makes any progress, even though the, the images you're generating aren't that nice, they don't look that good. Or if you just train your discriminator too much, your generator doesn't really know how to make progress and can't. Its, it's current model of the probability distribution just looks too different from what the other one is. is so it sort of doesn't work. And things can up, up, oscillate between solutions. So in other words, the generator can, its loss can go right down and it can seem to like it's doing very good. And then the, the discriminator can, loss can go right down and this can go back and forth. 
but none of them are really improving so much. So that's another problem that can happen. Um, and then another one is, is this idea of mode collapse, which is very common, right? So um, we've seen sort of examples there earlier on where, where this, is, this is when we don't really have any kind of mode collapse because we're getting lots of diversity and stuff like that. But a mode collapse you could imagine is, if we, imagine we trained on MNIST, right? The, the little digits, right? And then you start to generate samples, or you put in noise and you start to generate samples, and it always generates the number one, always, right? Now, the no it generates the number one maybe in different orientations, and they all look different, but it's never generating any of the other digits, right? So that means it's sort of collapsed to one mode, right? The mode around one, um, and it's just refusing to generate anything else, right? And of course, then the, the discriminator can't really tell the difference because the number ones really do look like, you know, real images, they're, they're pretty convincing. So, but it just shows to focus all its energy around one thing. So this is, this is something that can happen in practice. And there's some approaches to try and improve this, but this is a major area of research, right, to how to prevent this in certain cases. And probably another major difficulty if you want to do research in this area is it's, uh, it's difficult to evaluate how well you're doing, right, because you generate some images and you look at them and they go, yeah, they look nicer than these images, right? And you can get some people to evaluate them. And there's tricks like inception scores, which I'm not going to talk about, but it's just, it's not clear how to say that this, this, this GAN is better than this GAN, for example. Uh, I just want to talk about a few important developments on this, and I'm only going to mention them briefly, I guess. Um, so one thing you can't, probably should know about is the so-called Wasserstein GAN, right, or W GAN. Um, so the idea here is that um, in the standard GAN, you kind of use this KL divergence sort of base loss that you've, you've seen there earlier on. Um, and one of the issues with that is that if you know, the generator and the discriminator kind of get out of sync, or uh, there's, there's no support right, in one of the probability distributions with the other one that you're comparing, there's no, no good overlap. Right? When you look at KL divergence, when that happens, it basically goes to, to infinity. Right? So you're kind of, everything blows up essentially when you're training it, and you know, it's, not, it's not good. Right? So uh, this paper here basically looks at a few different measures, and then they say, well, you know, we, should, we shouldn't be using KL divergence or Janssen Shannon divergence or any of these things, we should be using something like uh, the Wasserstein distance or the earth movers distance, right? Uh, but unfortunately, that's intractable to compute usually when you're sort of trying to solve these things. Um, so if you don't know what it is, basically, in the top corner there, right, there's two, two probability distributions, right? And in the middle is a sort of a, a, possible, a possible joint distribution, right? Or a possible, they also it's equivalent to um, a transport plan, right? You want to move all the mass from one probability distribution to the other, right? Um, so the Wasserstein distance is basically the minimum over all possible transport plans of the cost of moving all of this probability from one place to the other. And you can call it the earth mover distance because you can imagine being in a, in a little bulldozer or something and pushing the probability from one distribution so it matches what the other one looks like, right? So that's the kind of intuition. Um, but yeah, so what they show is that, like, right, essentially, um, well, it's, it's from a different result, a different duality. Um, that you can say that this is basically the same as trying to match these distributions, or the, the outputs of your, your critic, right, which is not called a discriminator anymore because it doesn't just discriminate, but just matching the outputs of, of this critic in expectation to each other, right? That's essentially what it turns out to be, except you have to have this sort of minimization overall functions um, that are Lipschitz continuous. So the way that they do that in the paper is that you just you train the discriminator to convergence, right, within a sort of a box, right, in weight space, right. So you just clip clip the the weights so that they don't go outside this box, which is not a good not not a good thing to do, essentially. Um, and they they admit that in the paper, this weight clipping thing is pretty bad, but it kind of works. Um, but if you want to do this, they have a, a follow-up paper called Improved um, WGAN, which works a bit better. So the idea here is that it makes it more stable because with this distance you can, you can train the generator to convergence or for at least for a good while, right? And not be worried that they're going to get out of sync or theoretically anyway, that's what they say. Um, another one you can co should kind of know about is the so-called least squares GAN. So this is a really simple idea. They just said, well, let's just use the least squares distance, right, between what the, the critic on... Uh, the critic is outputting for the real images versus the generated images. Okay, so just take least squares distance there. Um, and then they show that that sort of corresponds to minimizing like the, the key squared divergence between the two distributions, right? So, uh, and that, that seems to work, you know, I mean, it seems like a silly thing to do at the first thought, like, you know, well, 
least squares difference between them, but yeah, it seems to work. Um, and this is some examples of it. All right, so these are quite nice, I think. Again, right, if you want to do these papers, right, you just restrict your domain and your examples will look a lot nicer, right? So don't train on lots of diverse data, just train on dining rooms or kitchens or, or whatever, or churches or whatever, and you get nice samples. Um, yeah, okay, another uh, one that sort of recent that I want to mention as well, this is from, um, I think, Jan LeCun um, said, he was saying that, okay, well, instead of, you know, just training a, a, a sort of a classifier as our discriminator or as our critic, uh, why not use an autoencoder, right? That's the basic idea here, right? So you train an autoencoder on the real images, right? So it gets really good at reconstructing real images, right? So you just, you know, autoencoders basically take, take the image, they sort of compress it down into some representation and expand it again, yeah. right? And they get good at this, and, but they're only good at reconstructing things that they've sort of near where they've seen before. So if you pass a generated image into this, it will probably be poor at reconstructing it, right? So you can use the... Uh, reconstruction error, or energy in this case, as your critic, right? That's the idea there. Right? So that's called an energy-based scan. And then the final one I want to mention is, well, what do you do next? You've got this energy-based scan and you've got this W GAN. Well, you just combine the two together and you get this B GAN, right? Boundary equilibrium GAN. And then they add an extra trick to, to maintain equilibrium between the, the generator and the discriminator. And you can generate really nice samples. So these are, these are generated faces at 64 by 64. And I mean, they're extremely, extremely convincing, right? So that works quite well. Yeah, but maybe just use it just for your you So uh, how far away are these samples from the images in the data set? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's absolutely something that you have to show, right? If, I, I think if you, if you want to present these results in a paper, right, you, you, you fit this to your data set, and then for each one of these, you show the nearest sample that's in the data set, right? And if it looks exactly like it, well, then perhaps it's just memorized the, the data set and it's giving back the, the, the things, right? I'm not showing that here, but I'm guessing in the paper they do something like that, right? <laughs> so. Uh, okay, final idea I want to mention and just show some examples of is the idea of a conditional GAN. All right, so this is uh, where you, you sort of train a, a, a generator, uh, but it's conditioned on something, right? So. It's, um, in other words, you can imagine I give you a category, I tell you, like birds, and then you have to go and generate some birds, right? So the, the GAN is given some extra information and it has to generate stuff using that, right? So it's conditioned on, on some variable. Okay, so this is shown here, right? We have some class. That, imagine we're doing class where I say bird or truck or something like that. And some random noise, and the, the class and the random noise go into the generator and it should generate some fake samples, right? Um, and then using the class, we can pick some real samples and then the discriminator has to tell the difference between them. And sometimes the discriminator needs access to the class as well, depending on what you're doing. Uh, so some nice things you can do with this is, well, you don't have to generate just their condition just on a class, right? You can condition on a, a sentence embedding, for example, right? So sentence embedding is a way of taking text and then producing some short vector that describes what the sentence looks like. So here's some, some examples from papers in 2016 where they basically took databases of birds and then some captions of, of what's in, in the image, right? And then you train one of these conditional GANs on this and you say, you know, then you give it, you give it a sentence embedding of a small bird with a black head and wings and feathers, gray wings, and it generates some birds that kind of look like what you've, you've asked for, right? So that's, that's kind of cool. Um, and you can see that on the, on the left they did it with flowers, right? So you can get some, you know, the, the flower has petals that are bright purplish pink with white stigma, yeah, I don't know. But anyway, it generates, generates some realistic looking flowers. And actually there's some, there's some new results that are even better than this now as well for that. But again, you can only really do this on a restricted domain so far. Um, yeah, so that kind of idea of a conditional GAN and stuff like that, um, you can kind of take this um, idea or so. So there's more to, to the GANs than just, just the generative aspect to it. And one is the, the idea of just using this adversary but using the adversary as some sort of loss or, or some sort of adaptive learned loss, right, when you're trying to, to do some other task. Um, one example where this is useful is predicting the future, right? So imagine you're, you're, you're looking at video frames and you'd like to predict what the video frame in three seconds is going to be, right? So you're watching a video of me and I've got my hand like this and I want, you want to predict what's it going to be in the next three seconds and I do that, okay? Well, I could have just as easily done that, right? So... If you wanted to get a good prediction of what the future was, and you're, 
the best way the best way is to hedge your bets and average over all possible futures, right? So produce a blurry hand that kind of goes everywhere, right? But if you want the real sample from the future, you don't want this mean of future events. You want to pick one of them, right? Um, so this is where these adversarial losses come in handy, because uh, so imagine we have these input frames at the top, um, and this is we want to generate a couple of frames in the future. So the ground truth looks like this. And if you just use Euclidean loss, you're going to generate something like this. So it's blurring over all possible futures. It's hedging its bets, basically. Um, but if you use like an adversary um, to kind of uh, tell the difference between real futures and fake futures that you've generated, you'll get something like this, right? Because it's quite easy for the adversary to, 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 to detect the blurry sample, right? Because it just looks for blurry samples, because they don't seem to happen in, in the real world. And then it says, OK, they're fake, right? So this forces. Um, the, the generator, right, the conditional generator, which is generating the future results, to generate something that's realistic looking. So the sample of all possible futures rather than the mean of all possible futures. Right? Um, so, yeah, similar ideas have been applied to image super resolution. Uh, we've applied them to saliency prediction, right, where we're trying to, you know, capture you know, more high level statistics in the generation, generated maps using an adversary to, to tell the difference between real ones and, and fake ones. Um, and that, that, this last slide I have, that idea was actually at the same time as we were doing that, people had actually done it even more generally and, and published a paper. Um, image to image translation, so this is the pix to pix work, which you might have heard of, which is, uh, I think some, some, some groups are using it in, in the project. Uh, so it's a particularly famous paper from, you know, uh, about a year and a half ago where you uh, can use this adversary to generate things like go from, from terrain images you collect from Google Maps to actual terrains, right? Um, or go from you know, black and white images to colorized images and stuff like that. Because you know, if you're just using L2 loss there, it'll, it'll average over all possible colors. Whereas if you use the adversary, it's kind of going to pick a color and stick with it, right? So it kind of gives you better looking results. Um, one I don't have a slide on here, but I do want to mention actually before we finish is that this does paired image to image translation, right? So you have to have pairs of where I'm coming from and where I'm going to, right? So you need to have the map and the image and they correspond to each other. There's another kind of situation called unpaired image to image translation where you have images from one domain and images from the other domain, but you don't know which ones correspond to each other, right? And if you're doing that kind of thing, you, could sh you can use like something like CycleGAN, right, which is able to translate between domains without ever having the, the pairing between the domain. And you can check out the paper on that if you want. But that allows you to get them results that you might have seen about like translating horses into zebras and stuff like that, right? Because you never have paired horses and zebras right from the same image because they don't just transform like that. But yeah, so that's that's uh, it's kind of where you would use pix to pix versus uh, DCGAN. Okay, so I'll leave it at that. Any questions?